It is a case that will launch one of the biggest manhunts in the province of Ontario's history. 72-year-old Harley Walker has disappeared, and the man police believe is responsible is on the run. Speeding through the Canadian countryside, driving into oncoming traffic like a madman. The surveillance team fights to keep him in their sights, for he carries with him a terrible secret, the hidden location of the missing senior who's seriously injured, perhaps even dead. And now, the could-be killer seems intent on self-destruction. He's picking up speed and taking the corner sharper and sharper. For lead investigator Pauline Gray, it's a nightmare. He's a desperate man, or he's a killer on the run. When police lose sight of him, had their suspect taken his own life? I also can't have him die. We need him. For investigators on the case, it's a terrible twist in a frightening and intriguing story of internet sex. He'd been using the bulletin board system to, to pick up dates financial extortion. The checks raised a red flag. The visa raised a red flag. And the hunt for a brutal predator. I suspect that he knew that he had let a monster into his life. The quiet community of Cabbage Town is steps from downtown Toronto, but you'd hardly know it. This neighborhood in Canada's largest city is a little piece of paradise for those who live here, like 72-year-old Harley Walker, and even those who visit. I used his house as my oasis too, I mean I was, I, I would go there to write. And to eat. I was probably over there for dinner three nights a week. He was a really excellent cook. He had an encyclopedic knowledge of jazz, which was really phenomenal. He's just a really interesting person to talk to about anything. A former television director and respected member of Toronto's gay community, Harley Walker liked nothing more than to entertain friends in his comfortable kitchen and beautiful backyard garden. He was pretty set in his ways, so he, he had things he liked to do and places he would go, and, and his circle was pretty defined. Which is why Greg Seal is surprised when his good friend and former lover suddenly disappears from sight. The last time I saw Harley was the Thanksgiving Monday. I tried calling him the Thursday and didn't get a hold of him. And then by the Friday, I was still calling the house and I was a little suspicious. Seal is relieved when he finally hears from Harley by email. I can remember the date because it was Friday the 13th. The message was a bit cryptic, something along the lines of, I have to leave town, I'll be in touch when I return. So I immediately picked up the phone and called his place, and there was no answer. When the weekend comes and goes without Harley getting in touch, Seal spends a sleepless Sunday night. On Monday morning, he sets out for Harley's house. When I turned the corner and I saw his car there, I knew he was home. Well, I mean, the car was home. And that's when I went up to the doorbell. Now walks a person I'd never seen before. The man tells Seal that Harley had gone out of town for the weekend and that he'd stopped in to check on the plants. I could see the car and I'm thinking, well, you're lying. But what I immediately did is I, I laughed. Greg Seal is now more concerned than ever. Where had Harley really gone? And why was this strange man in Harley's home alone? Seal contacts a mutual friend living in the neighborhood, and the two of them return. So maybe, you know, an hour later from the time I had first rang the doorbell. And 
but uh, there's no sign of, of the person. Nothing really looked out of place. Then Seal notices five days of unopened newspapers at the front door. You know, it just seemed right out of character. Even if Harley was really, really busy, he would pick up the Globe Mail from the porch, open it, and at least read something with his morning coffee. So with great hesitation, I decide that I'm going to go up to his computer. There, Seal finds something that seems to confirm his worst fears. An email, apparently from Harley, sent to his financial advisor, asking him to liquidate everything in his portfolio. My first thought was, can you do that in an email? I knew that Harley didn't do his investments that way. Had Harley been forced to send the email? Perhaps by the man who'd answered his door? Immediately, I felt sick, physically sick. Seal contacts police to report his friend missing and then meets the officer at Harley's home. It was like a bad television show all of a sudden. He was outright nasty. Like he, he said, well, this Harley, maybe he doesn't want you in his life anymore and you just can't take the hint like I was a stalker or something. The usually social senior Harley Walker hasn't been seen or heard from in nearly a week. So friend Greg Seal heads to his house looking for him. That's when a man he's never met before answers Harley's front door. What shocked me was that there was a stranger in his house without him being there. Seal returned to the house with a friend later that day to find the guest gone and a suspicious email sent from Harley's computer. It was to his financial advisor asking him to dissolve everything in his portfolio and make it out to a, a check. Seal contacts local police, but they suggest he's a jealous lover left behind by a vacationing Harley Walker. I'm worried that a crime has taken place, and I can't believe that I can't get anybody to listen to me. Worse still, police now believe that Seal might be lying to them. The next door neighbor clearly saw myself and what she said was Harley in the backyard the day before. And now, you know, 12 hours later, I'm claiming that he's been missing for a week. But that was not Harley. That was my other friend who happens to be retired and has white hair like Harley. We were in the backyard looking for Harley. To get the authorities on side, Seal contacts Harley's financial advisor and has him report a crime. Thursday, I got a phone call from a detective. And it's, it's a world of difference when you talk to a detective. It just really is. That detective is Barry Radford. Greg was being truthful. They didn't have a tiff. They are really good friends. They do talk every day. OK, now why would Harley not continue his normal routine? This is his normal routine. It raises red flags. Radford decides to open an investigation into Harley's disappearance. His first step, to send a uniformed officer to Harley's bank. So he went there and just said, would you mind just giving us an idea of any kind of activity that's been going on in his account? We're just trying to find out where he is, what he's been doing. We'd find out that his visa had been used to purchase some gas. Police tracked down the gas station's surveillance video. They saw a person using the pay pass, and they saw it was being used to pump gas into a white van. Could it be Harley Walker? You could tell it was a male, uh, a younger male. Why is a man using Harley's pay pass to fill up gas in a rental vehicle? It started to, very early on, just feel not quite right. Detective Sergeant Pauline Gray is assigned as lead investigator on the case. We look at the newspapers not in the bin anymore, the blinds not being opened anymore. All those things that we do on a daily basis, that's our initial starting point, is when these things stop. And there are other signs, says Pauline's police partner, Detective Ian Briggs. If he had gone away, he certainly hadn't taken his car, and he hadn't packed any luggage nor had he taken his toothbrush and glasses. It was fall, and there was leaves sort of blown into the doorway. And as little as I knew Harley at that point, I knew just by walking in the house and getting that sense 
that that's not something he would do. He wouldn't leave his house in that condition. Video shot by police at the time of the investigation reveals other subtle traces of trouble. His vacuum cleaner was laying out in the, uh, the main area, which was unusual, according to his friend. Throughout his upstairs, Harley had these Indian carpets. It has a nap that catches things. And the carpets had been drawn into the doorways. What that said to me, that something had been dragged. Not something the meticulous Harley Walker would have done. So who had, and why? Walked into Harley's bedroom, and what I saw was matching pillowcases and no duvet. Is there a simple explanation, or do the missing bedding and bunched up rugs paint a more sinister picture? It looked to me like the duvet had been dragged out of the room and down the stairs, and the carpets in turn had come with it. Downstairs on the kitchen counter, investigators discover even more telling evidence. A shower curtain, packing tape, a roll of heavy-duty garbage bags. For Pauline Gray, they all point towards foul play. We started thinking in terms of that somebody was looking to wrap something. Homebody Harley Walker has been missing for nearly two weeks. It's enough to cause friend Greg Seal to head to Harley's looking for him. First, a man he has never met answers Harley's door. Then Seal discovers an email sent from Harley's computer instructing his broker to liquidate all his assets. Worried about the fate of his friend, Seal calls local police, but at first they don't take his concern seriously. I mean, it was frustrating, and I can't believe that I can't get anybody to listen to me. It's not until Harley's broker contacts the authorities that a search for the senior gets underway. That's when police learn that someone has used Harley's credit card to gas up a rented van. Homicide investigators conduct an extensive search of Harley's home and discover the duvet missing from the bedroom. Hallway rugs that look as though something has been dragged across them and shrink wrap, packing tape, and a shower curtain in the kitchen. Afraid that Harley has been abducted and needs rescuing, lead investigator Pauline Gray calls in a forensic specialist. Given the packing supplies and shower curtain in the kitchen, Detective Todd Carefoot begins his search there. So I got down on my hands and knees with a flashlight and just started looking inch by inch across the kitchen floor, starting at the doorway. Carefoot finds what he's after. It was very small, like be the size of a head of a pin. It'd be dried blood that's now adhered to the floor. Tiny traces, almost invisible to the naked eye. But they are everywhere. Then I started to look at the sink itself, and I found there was two small pieces of coagulated blood that was almost going down the drain of the sink. Then Carefoot looks upwards. On the ceiling, bloody remnants of a violent assault. For instance, if someone was stabbing someone with a knife, the knife would become bloodstained, and then some of the blood will be projected normally upwards onto a wall or onto the ceiling. The stakes are much higher at that point. That cast off meant that there had been some transference of blood from a weapon or a fist to the ceiling. Does this blood belong to Harley Walker? What grisly scene took place in this comfortable kitchen? And can police find their victim before it's too late? In his determined search for answers, Carefoot turns to forensic science. If there's a porous surface like a tile floor, if there was blood there, a quantity of blood, it's now been wiped clean, there's still gonna be small traces of blood that's trapped inside the pores. So what we do is we use a blood reagent. It's a chemical that'll adhere to the hemoglobin in the blood and it makes it turn purple. And in this case, reveal the marks of a cloth, someone's desperate attempt to mop up a huge amount of blood. And there is more visual evidence of the gruesome cleanup. The chemical developed some toe marks that were on the floor in blood right in front of the kitchen sink. You could see all five toes on the ball of his feet. By looking at that, you could just really visualize seeing the suspect standing there at the kitchen sink, washing blood off his hands, 
but the suspect has been sloppy and the investigators are not. In the very edge of the shrink wrap was a slight amount of blood. When you see something like that, it's very graphic. It gives you an impression that he was actually using this to, to bind up the body to remove him from the house. That's when Gray recalls a videotaped statement to police made by Harley's friend, Greg Seal. What we do catch from this video is that Greg saw things that he didn't realize he saw. Like in the few seconds before the stranger answered Harley Walker's door. His front door has a glass bit on it. It diffuses the image, so you can't 100% see clearly, but there was like something orange in the hall and that looked to me at the time like scaffolding, like it was a color of scaffolding, and, and it kind of puzzled me. But based on Greg Seal's description and the investigator's experience, they think it's something else entirely. And that was a dolly. It was a moving dolly. When he was leaving, he mentions that he looks to his left and he sees a moving van. And those two things become paramount in the investigation later on. The only thing you'd need a moving fan and a dolly for would be to move a body. Detective Todd Carefoot doubles his efforts in the hope that Harley Walker could still be alive. He discovers secreted away in the dining room amongst Harley's jazz records, a large plastic garbage bag. It was concealed very well. As soon as you opened up, you could smell decomposition inside the bag. Now I could see there was a number of bloodstained clothing in there. 72-year-old Harley Walker has disappeared, and friend Greg Seal has finally convinced police to investigate. When they find evidence of foul play upstairs and strange packing materials downstairs, they call in forensics detective Todd Carefoot. He detects widespread blood spatter throughout the kitchen, a strong indication of a brutal assault. Then, using a chemical that adheres to hemoglobin in the blood, Carefoot finds extensive evidence of a cleanup, including bloody footprints at the kitchen sink. And hidden behind Harley's record collection, he discovers a plastic bag containing blood-soaked towels and clothing. Now, police have found another clue, one they hope will lead them to Harley's attacker. There was a receipt that was in the bag for buying some plastic wrap, which is the same as was found in the kitchen with the, the shower curtain. Was it possible that the person who purchased the wrapping material was caught on the stationery store's surveillance camera? While police contact the store, lead investigator Pauline Gray asks a forensic pathologist to join them at Harley's house. We wanted him to look at the amount of blood that we believe was in the home and let us know, was it possible that somebody could survive this much blood loss? And he said, yes, it was possible. It was possible that somebody could bleed like this and still survive. In her search for the culprit who had abducted Harley, Gray turns her attention to the senior's computer. There was several websites that Harley was on daily. He really did spend hours on the internet some of that time spent hooking up with men. He'd been using the bulletin board system to, to pick up dates. Meeting men through the internet, through a couple of uh, chat lines in the city. And so there were possibly hundreds of avenues that had to be tracked down. Potential leads in a case that was becoming more serious by the hour. Some of Harley's friends had long worried about his online romances, including Brian Gloyd. I had mentioned to him, I said, you know, just, just watch it because people can be anything they want online. You have no idea. I and mean, oh yeah, yeah, I know, no problem, no problem. His first choice was to have a new online person come to his house. He felt safest in his house and more comfortable that way. And Harley's computer was his little black book. Gray brings in tech crimes to examine it a labor-intensive process of tracking IP addresses to find the person behind every suspicious email or online chat. We felt that that was going to be the key or help us find where Harley was. Meanwhile, Detective Barry Radford is continuing his search into Harley Walker's financial affairs and has discovered suspicious check transactions on Harley's account. Through the cooperation of the bank, they contacted the person who actually 
cashed the checks, and that person subsequently called me later in the afternoon. His name is David Reed. And he admitted that, yes, those were his checks, and yes, he'd cashed them, and yes, he knew Harley. So I asked him if he'd come in and have a chat with me, and he said he, was, he would. Actually, I was quite surprised how fast he showed up, and uh, he agreed to be interviewed. Well, that's not behavior you would normally assume would come from somebody who is involved. You know, he's willing to come in for an interview. He came right away. Oh, he's, a, he's quite a big man. I would say about 6'2", over 200 pounds. He had mentioned that there was this guy from Mississauga, um, big beefy guy that he was getting to know, met him online. But David Reed tells Radford and his partner that he'd met Harley Walker by chance at a coffee shop close to the senior's home. Not only that. He made a point of saying that he wasn't gay, he was married with a son. So it wasn't anything more than friendship, which was fine with me, but I never approach, approached that. He volunteered that information to me. I can't say it was an ongoing sexual thing, but I, I would say that I find it hard to believe that Harley would continue relations with him had there not been something sexual. Could that have been David Reed at Harley's house days earlier? And was Reed the one who rented the white van? I asked him about renting a van. Oh yeah, he admitted that he'd rented a van because he was moving. Well, why were you moving? Oh, I'm financial problems. Money's kind of tight. That's why Harley gave me the money, just to help me over the hump. So uh, he took he took the money and cashed it. But he missed out a lot of things. Like he never told us about using Harley's pay pass to fill up gas in a rental vehicle. Sometimes people lie to us to hide other parts of their lifestyle. Perhaps David Reed was lying to us because he was financially a mess and his wife and friends didn't know. Perhaps he was uncomfortable with the fact that maybe he was gay. At the end of the interview, he just said, you know, I just, want to help Harley. I just want to help whatever you, I can do to help you guys farm, find him. I'd never do anything to Harley. That's what he said just prior to leaving. Back at Harley's house, forensic expert Todd Carefoot has finished looking for blood and begun the search for fingerprints. We started at the front door. We found what appeared to be a left thumbprint on the inside of the mail slot, inside of the front door. And that was significant because anatomically that would show that whoever left that fingerprint was in control of the house for a period of time because he removed mail from the mail slot. Could the print belong to David Reed, and might he have had a hand in Harley Walker's disappearance? A lot of uh, bases for fingerprints is when people perspire. And when they perspire, usually when they're, they're doing something bad and they're feeling guilty. But Reed seems an unlikely criminal. We had done a background check on David Reed and found out he had absolutely no police record. Uh, we had no record of even simple things like parking tags or speeding tickets. Police compare the fingerprint from the mailbox to those in the countrywide fingerprint database, but find no match. As much as TV likes to portray us as these forensic gods, basically our work is done through talking to people talking to people, interviewing them. They give us tiny little pieces, shreds of the puzzle, and we put them all together. And now, police have found what could well be a big piece of the puzzle. The surveillance footage from the stationery store clearly shows David Reed entering the store, then calmly purchasing the plastic wrap and packing tape found in Harley Walker's kitchen materials police believe were used to abduct Harley Walker. Police have found evidence of a violent struggle and bloody cleanup in the home of missing senior Harley Walker, causing lead investigator Pauline Gray to call in a forensic pathologist. He determines that despite the blood loss, the injured 72-year-old could still be alive. Gray has tech crimes comb through Harley's computer in a search for suspects amongst his online dates. And police investigating Harley's bank records find recent checks written on Harley's account. Detectives call in the man who cashed them, 42-year-old unemployed financial advisor, David Reed. In his interview, Reed tells police that Harley lent him the money because he was broke 
and he admits to having rented the white van parked outside of Harley's house around the time the senior went missing. But David Reed leaves out the fact that he'd used Harley's pay pass to gas up the van and that he'd recently purchased the same plastic wrap and packing tape that police believe was used to bind up Harley to remove him from the house. Now, investigators have received frightening new intel about Reed from another police force. We had information that David Reed had um, been involved in plotting something like this before, where they were going to tie up and extort money from an older couple. And once they got the money, then they were going to kill them and bury them. Police had no hard evidence in that case, so Reed was never charged. But his apparent involvement in such a vicious plan sends a chill through the investigation team. They tracked down David Reed's rental van. Forensic officers found deposits of what we believe to be blood, one on the handle, one in the back of the van. And they were able to match and very early on tell us that, in fact, the blood in the back of the van matched Harley's DNA. So we knew Harley was in that van and Harley's bleeding. They also know that if there is any hope of saving the senior, police need to find him fast. But where had David Reed taken Harley? Using information from local communications towers, investigators trace the movement of the man who has quickly become their number one suspect. So we were able to see that David Reed's cell phone was hitting towers close to Harley Walker's home and then able to see that that particular phone was bouncing off towers right up the highway and into uh, northern Ontario, or what we call northern southern Ontario. At the same time, we find out that David Reed had a family-owned cottage up in the Copaconk area. And we had the odometer from the moving van. And the moving van had gone about what you'd need to do to go north to Copaconk and back in one day. All signs pointed to the distinct possibility that Reed had hidden Harley at his family cottage. Armed provincial police scramble to locate the cabin, then cautiously move in. They carefully search the premises, but find no evidence of Harley Walker, dead or alive. Despite their disappointment, investigators are more convinced than ever that David Reed is their man, and they're not the only ones. It seemed to me that this David Reed, when I saw his picture, maybe would be the type for Harley. Like, he was kind of beefy, he was very good looking. Um, and I think maybe Harley would buy a story from this guy, you know? But unless they can find Harley, Reed's involvement in the senior's abduction will be difficult to prove. Police decide to casually ask Reed to drop by the station for a second interview. We didn't want to set off any bells. But just in case their suspect decides to make a run for it. We uh, got a surveillance team on David Reed and sent the investigators up to knock on his door. So he stepped out on the porch. I said, we just need to clarify a few things because we are based on our investigation. You're the last person who actually saw Harley. So we just need a little bit more information from you. Would you mind coming into the station and, uh, and have another chat with us? He did agree to come in. He said as soon as his wife arrived home, he would come in for the second interview. Radford heads to the station and the surveillance team waits just out of sight of Reed's home. Does Reed know that the investigation team is on to him? Will he panic and unknowingly lead them to Harley? I'm not on the road, I'm told, uh, five minutes. And Reed's wife had returned home. She went in the house, he walked out the house, jumped in his car, drove south for about two minutes, made a U-turn and drove due north. And north is the complete opposite of coming in for an interview. David Reed appears to be on the run. Surveillance kept telling me that he was driving somewhat erratically, and uh, it was difficult for the surveillance team to keep up to him. But investigators can't afford to let Reed out of their sight. 
and I made a phone call and we got a plane up and had the plane start conducting surveillance so that the surveillance team could pull back a little bit. He's driving up the highway, he's driving into oncoming traffic. And that speaks to me of a man who's desperate. If Reed did abduct Harley in order to extort money from him, had he killed the senior in the process? The only one who could answer that question is Reed himself. The evidence against David Reed in the abduction of 72-year-old Harley Walker is piling up. Not only did Reed use the senior's pay pass to gas up the same rental van seen outside of Harley's home, Reed also recently cashed checks on Harley's account. A forensic search of Reed's rental van found traces of Harley's blood, and Reed's cell phone records revealed their suspect traveled to Cobaconk, Ontario, the location of David Reed's family cottage. Police search the property but find no evidence of Harley Walker. When investigators discover that Reed had planned a previous extortion, and see surveillance footage of him buying the plastic wrap and packing tape they believe he used to abduct Harley Walker, they send detectives to his North Toronto home. But instead of heading to police headquarters as promised, Reed flees into the countryside. And now we have a guy on the loose who we believe has a hand in Harley's disappearance. Police use surveillance vehicles and a plane to track him. He stops at a conservation area, and he gets out and he walks around the conservation area. Believe it or not, we start thinking about protecting the life of David Reed, because he's behaving like somebody who may be going to commit suicide. Rather than arrest Reed and risk him clamming up about where he's hidden Harley, investigators wait and watch in the hopes he'll eventually lead them to the abducted senior. But there's a problem. The plane had uh, run out of fuel, so they had to turn around and literally glide back to Toronto. And the surveillance uh, vehicles had to move in again. And it was becoming dark. Their headlights were becoming visible. And David Reed was driving quite erratically. Surveillance police are forced to back off so as not to be noticed by Reed. That's when the situation gets out of control. He's going around Country Block, which is a good square mile. But he's picking up speed and taking the corner sharper and sharper. They were worried about uh, the surveillance, so they just stayed at the four corners, tucked away, and watched him. At this point, uh, there's a great bang. They thought that he had committed suicide, that he'd shot himself. If David Reed is dead, Harley Walker may never be found. The officers go down the country road looking, and the windows are, are smashed out. The car is in really bad condition, uh, but David Reed's nowhere to be found, literally vanished. While the surveillance team searches the immediate area, and investigators call for provincial police backup. After the accident, his car was impounded and brought back to our office. They found uh, Harley Walker's camera and also his wallet with driver's license in the trunk of the car. David Reed is clearly their man, and now they've lost him. At first light, the police launch an intensive ground search. So we brought in dogs, and the dog followed the scent from the car to a river, which was nearby. And then uh, there was no more scent after the river. The tracking dogs had lost Reed's smell when he crossed the water. But police are convinced this area is where they'll find Harley Walker. It's at this point that we find out, through a police officer, as a matter of fact, who knew David Reed, grew up with him, that they uh, went to a scout camp together that was in Cobaconk. And so we really did sort of focus on that's probably where Harley was. But their hopes of locating Harley still alive are dwindling. The Cobaconk area has been used on a number of times by criminals to take bodies from the city up and get rid of them. It's a large, marshy, lake-filled area. There were abandoned wells, uh, little caves, abandoned houses, outbuildings. 
there was just thousands upon thousands of places to hide a body just within uh, a kilometer or two of the particular tower that David Reed's cell phone had been bouncing off of. It is gradually becoming clear that what was a rescue is now the search for a body. It's like a slow, leeching realization that, that in all likelihood, you know, Harley's not with us anymore. Harley's gone. And now I'm investigating a murder without a body. It is now November, three weeks since Harley Walker's disappearance and days into the search for what is certainly his killer. With winter fast approaching, police step up their manhunt. We brought officers in from all over Ontario uh, and set up a command post. We had farmers checking their fields. In fact, we did find out that David was up there by just that, by somebody finding that somebody had been living in their shed. A lady had gone out to her garden shed and found it disturbed. It appeared that someone had actually been sleeping in her shed. And he's left behind a fingerprint, which police compare to those found on David Reed's business documents. They get a match. So we now knew that David Reed was alive and on the run and still within the Gray County area. That's one of those times when you think, I'm coming. Like, I'm coming to get you. Their wait is almost over. Pauline and I were in the office, uh, and uh, it was late evening. We were working on the case. We're sitting across from each other. Um, we had uh, been tracking uh, David's phone, uh, but it had been off. Uh, and so we really didn't have any idea where he was. We received two phone calls almost simultaneously. The first call was from our technical people that said David Reed had just fired up his cell phone. And Ian's phone call was from the OPP who said that they were closing in on a cottage where they believed that he was. Tailing their prime suspect in the abduction of missing senior Harley Walker, David Reed crashes his car before disappearing from sight, launching one of the largest manhunts in Ontario's history. Provincial police comb the countryside looking for Reed and for his victim, whom they now believe is dead. First, they find evidence Reed had been sleeping in a garden shed. The OPP was able to lift a fingerprint from one of the doors. It's definitely David Reed's fingerprint. Then they get a visit from a startled local cottager. When he walked into the room, into the cottage, a person's wallet had, was open on, I believe it was a table. He literally left the cottage right away and drove to the OPP station. Within minutes, a SWAT team descends on the cottage. After over a week of running from police, David Reed surrenders to them. But will he give up Harley Walker's body? Investigators transport their suspect back to Toronto. You're sitting in the back seat with a killer, and I spoke to him the whole way home, a long drive, several hours in the car with them. We told David Reed basically that we knew that he was responsible for Harley Walker having gone missing and that we were assuming he was dead. They accuse Reed of befriending Harley, probably through a dating site, in order to extort money from the senior. When Harley refused to cooperate, the thinking goes, Reed killed him, then hid the body. Back at the station with Reed, investigators bring out maps of the Kobokonk area. And he looked at them long and hard, and I really believed he was on the edge of showing us where Harley was. But then he just withdrew and said, no, I'm, I, uh, I don't want to say anything at this point. Leaving investigators with the painstaking task of trying to come up with the evidence they'll need to convict David Reed of murder. We have lots of circumstantial, but we don't have anybody seeing David ever with Harley. We don't have anybody seeing him rolling him out of the house. We don't have anybody seeing David Reed driving the van. You know, all those are holes that can be punched in by defense. And all they need is a reasonable doubt. That's all a jury needs. But investigators are determined to charge David Reed even without Harley Walker's body. Over the next few months, they work to assemble their case until they're confident they have enough for a conviction. 
Only then do they get a call from David Reed. His lawyer has phoned. He wants to, uh, wants to give up Harley. In exchange for a second degree murder sentence, David Reed would tell them where he hid Harley's body. So David drew us a map. He drew the driveway of the Boy Scout camp and drew um, an X where he believed he had buried Harley. The following day, armed with a video camera, investigators joined forensics officers at the site. We had a thaw, it was getting warm, and the body was starting to decompose. And so the dog went in, and in 13 seconds, the dog hit. Reed had marked the spot with a branch cross. After four and a half hours of painstaking digging, we discover this crypt, basically, in the ground. It was a bizarre reality to see that container come out of the ground, uh, covered in dirt, uh, slightly damaged, and know that uh, there was a human being inside that case. He had, had made a casket out of a plastic storage container and boxes that he had because he was, of course, moving. And now the shrink wrap and the packing tape that we had seen the very first day in Harley's home. An autopsy reveals that Harley Walker had been stabbed in the heart. Strangely, yeah, I, I definitely thought of those last moments. Like, I thought Harley figured it out. And like most of Harley's meetings, they were in the kitchen or the solarium where they would have coffee. And the butcher block of knives is right there. And Reed just picked up the knife and stabbed Harley. David Reed says he was driven to do it when after months of being friends, Harley insisted on more. I can't say for sure, but I can tell you that David Reed was extremely desperate. He was living in a house of cards. He was uh, maxed out on all levels of personal finance. Even when Harley said, I don't loan money, David saw his life crashing down around him, and he saw a way to get that money. On August 31st, 2007, David Reed was convicted of second degree murder and given the maximum sentence of life in prison with no chance of parole for 17 years. In May of 2010, Detective Sergeant Pauline Gray received a prestigious award from the Ontario Homicide Investigators Association for her outstanding courage, tenacity, and compassion.